Morning, everyone. How are we doing? So, this is it. Last class. How are we doing? Questions while we wait for others? I think it's going to be more or less even. Maybe a bit more post midterm. I want to have a short final exam. No need to uh, put too many questions. So probably something like six questions again. Well, let's say between six and eight. So uh, short, uh, I mean, we, we probably did a bit more post midterm. So, but, but a lot of the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So let's say more or less 50, 50, maybe a bit more post midterm. Let's call it 60, 40 kind of, kind of thing. Yeah. Questions in the meantime? If there are no questions, we'll uh, talk about a few things today. You know, we were talking about uh, paradoxes, things that don't seem true but actually are. Let me bring your attention to to the Coke snowflake. The Coke snowflake is an infinitely long curve that is contained in a finite space. And how is the Coke snowflake constructed? You start with an equilateral triangle. A triangle which has sides of length one. And remove the middle third, so very much like like the Cantor set, we will remove the middle third and replace it with an equilateral triangle of sides the same length you removed. So. We remove the middle third, this had length one third. So now
This is made up of four pieces of length one third. And you know, I'm going to do the same thing here. Remove the middle third. And finally, remove the middle third right here. So, right, I mean, you started in your first step, you had a perimeter, right? Three sides of length one. So three sides of length one, we had a perimeter of three. In your second step, right? One, two, three, four. Each side, if you will, right? Has length four thirds. And you've got three of these. So you now have a perimeter of length four. And repeat. Each side, you're going to remove the middle third and replace it with an equilateral triangle. happening, right? And so on and so on. This side used to have length one third. So a third of them, a third of that is one ninth. So now you have one, two, three, four. four sides of length one over nine. And then you have one, two, three, four of these. And then well, times three again. Right, which is, which is really four squared over three squared. Right, and eventually you see a pattern, right? This is four thirds times three. This is four thirds squared times three. And if you keep going, removing every middle third and replacing it with I'm gonna stop now, but you see what's happening, right? You can keep going and eventually Right, this is going to be four over three to the power of three, and so on and so on. So at every step of the way, you have larger and larger powers of four over three. And this gets larger and larger because it's a fraction that's bigger than one. So when you take powers of things bigger than one, they get larger and larger, going off to infinity. So as this process gets as you keep going and going, the curve gets longer and longer, going to infinity. Kameen is asking if I'll give you a uh, list of concepts. Well, let's say this. Certainly, everything that came before the midterm, you need to know. What came after the midterm? Uh, did we have uh, did we have series on the midterm? I forget now. For sure, you should know series. Uh, you need to know induction. So series, induction. And so far, what do I have? I have a question 
on silver coinage. And I have a question on the Ernest Strauss conjecture. Let's say that you should you should be comfortable with uh, the Hilbert Hotel as well. Yeah. So let's. Uh, if there's anything else, I'll post in an announcement. But I think that should do it. Questions? Anybody? So my point is, right, this, if you keep going forever, you get a larger and larger curve, and this curve is always contained in some circle. So you have an infinitely long curve contained in a finite space. Questions, anybody, on, uh, on anything? Stuff you want to discuss? Or are we moving on to the Moser worm problem? The Moser worm problem After Leo Moser, and interestingly enough, when I came to McGill, uh, Leo Moser's younger brother, William Moser, was a professor in the math department. Here is Moser's worm problem. Follow me. Let me give it to you as stated here. And then I'll explain what this means. What is the smallest area? No. What is the area of the smallest region? that can accommodate every plane curve of length four. How long have I been teaching in the Gill? Well, that's the thing, right? As some of you may know, I, I did all my studies here. So I came to McGill as an undergraduate student in 1991, and I've been here ever since. So I started teaching in one form or another in, in 95 when I was, when I started doing the masters. Right, I mean, I, I would be a graduate student. I would, uh, I would teach courses and uh, I've been teaching uh, essentially every semester since. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I, I think they do appreciate me. And I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very lucky that, uh, I'm very lucky to still be teaching here. Absolutely. So it's a great school and I like it very much.
right? So Leo Moser's work problem, work problem, and uh, William Moser uh, was still teaching here when I uh, when I came to McGill. Now, I never had a course with him, but uh, I knew who he was, which is very interesting. What's the What's the question? Imagine that you have a curve of length one, right? So a piece of string of some unit length, one meter, one centimeter, it doesn't matter, of length one. We are asking the question, or rather, Moser was asking the question, can you cover this with some shape? What is the smallest area that shape can have, which will cover any curve of length one? Obviously, a semicircle of diameter one or, a, or a, a radius one will do the trick. This will cover any curve of length one. Right? I mean, even if you have That curves, right, like a 90 degree angle where this is one half and one half, you can still place that over and it's going to cover that curve. This is still an open problem. Nobody knows the answer. Right, so right, the idea is if you have these bad looking curves, I mean they're easy to to draw, but what is the smallest area needed to cover every single curve? Right, so I mean, you have something like this, you have maybe something like this. Right, so again, imagine a piece of string of length one and you can place it any way you want. What is the shape? And more importantly, what is the area? Why isn't it just the area of a sphere? Well, first of all, that where we're saying plane, right? So we don't need to go to 3D. 2D is fine. And consequently, you're thinking to yourself, well, why not a circle of radius one? And of course, circle of radius one works. Absolutely, this works. Circle of radius one works. It's gonna cover every every curve, and that's fine. But is that the smallest? Is that the smallest area? That's the question. Could you not just take a half circle? And I claim a half circle does the trick. But other are, is there a smaller shape, right? So just because this one works, doesn't mean it's the smallest one, right? So these two work. This is smaller than that. Is there something smaller? Let me give you the result of Norwood and Poole. In 
2003, which says that the minimum shape has area at most 0 0.26047. And in 2019, right, so, so this is actually smaller than the half circle. And in 2019, a few people um, claim to have proven this wedge, this 30 degree wedge, of a circle of radius one, right? So in fact, you don't need a whole circle. You only need this wedge of 30 degrees. That's the claim at least. Uh, two papers have been published. They haven't been reviewed yet. That's their claim, but again, this might not be the minimum. This might not be the minimum. And, you know, I mean, there's a nice parallel to be made with this and the famous Okay, a needle problem. And what is the okay, a needle problem? Suppose you had a needle of length one. The question is, what is the area of the smallest shape you need to be able to rotate this 180 degrees? Right, so suppose you have a needle and let's label the endpoints AB. We want to flip it around So then it, it looks like this. What is the area of the smallest region you need to flip this around? Well, of course, if you had a circle of diameter one, you could just rotate. That's very easy. Is there a shape that is less is there a shape whose area is less? And if you have an equilateral triangle of length one, right? So suppose your needle rests here, you can move it to there, move the A to there, and then move the B to there. And then move the A back down. So now you would you would have rotated your needle, and this area is smaller than that area. And you know you can make this a bit better because really, what are you doing? Right? You, you have your needle here. You're moving it like this. Right, so I mean, again, suppose you had this like that. If you're moving it, this doesn't need to be straight, right? You could have had it curved a bit like this and like this. And that would have worked, right? Well, actually, you're, you're out of that, so, so that's okay. 
I mean, you want to stay inside the shape at all times. So, and, and, and you know, for the longest time, it was believed that this was the optimal shape, that this was the shape of smallest area. For a long, long time, it was, I mean, there, there was never any proof that it was, but people thought that you couldn't make this any better until somebody came up with the idea of having some sort of star shape. Right, and you can imagine, very much like a bad driver trying to parallel park, that you're moving very little at a time until you come back to the original, but you're upside down. And you can make this have area as small as you want. any epsilon greater than zero. So take any small number that you want, as long as it's bigger than zero, and you can make a star shape like this, which will have area equal to that, or less. So maybe we have the same thing happening with the worm. Who knows? How are we doing? You may have heard of the, of the game Straight to Bacon. Have you? It was popular when the internet started. The idea being that Kevin Bacon was the center of the Hollywood universe. Because at some point in time, he was in like almost every movie. And the idea was that if you take any actor you can trace that actor back to Kevin Bacon through movies. What am I talking about? Consider Orlando Bloom. Right? So for those of you unfamiliar with the, with the game, you want to trace back Orlando Bloom. Orlando Bloom is obviously not Kevin Bacon. And in fact, he never appeared in a movie with Kevin Bacon. I mean, unless that has changed in the past year, I haven't checked. But... Orlando Bloom did not appear in a movie with Kevin Bacon, but Orlando Bloom 
appeared in Main Street. with Colin Firth. And Colin Firth was in a movie where the truth lies. Right, this is based on the idea that everybody is separated by at most six people, right? That's six degrees of separation, an idea that came about in the 1920s. Right, so, so that's the game. You give an actor and you try to find the shortest path to Kevin Bacon. And associated to that, you can give numbers known as the Bacon number. Kevin Bacon has Bacon number zero. If you're not Kevin Bacon, but have appeared in a movie with Kevin Bacon, then you have Bacon number one. Colin Firth has Bacon number one. If you're not Kevin Bacon, and have never appeared in a movie with Kevin Bacon, but have appeared in a movie with somebody who's appeared in a movie with Kevin Bacon. Then you have Bacon number two, Orlando Bloom has Bacon number two, and so on and so on. Let's take another example OJ Simpson. was in Naked Gun, 33 and a third, with Elliot Gould. Elliot Gould, is that two L's? Elliot? was in Main Street with Kevin Bacon. I, I don't believe there are other rules. That, that's the only rule. And you're, you're suggesting that you can probably connect anyone if you spend enough time finding it. And, and that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. Right? This, this idea of six degrees of separation is that you can connect yourself or anyone else to any other person through at most six people. Right, so Elliot Gould has Bacon number one. O.J. Simpson, which who never did a movie with Kevin Bacon, has Bacon number two.
No, it, did I say Main Street? It's not Main Street. No, no, not Main Street. Not Main Street at all. Sorry about that. Not Main Street. Main Street, let's get the movie right here. It's the big picture. Sorry about that. You can uh, have fun doing this. Of course, you probably expected that there was a website dedicated to this. There is Oracle of Bacon. .org, where you can trace, right? I mean, you you give. Well, I mean, go to that website. You'll see what happens. But you you give the name of an actor, and they trace it back to Kevin Bacon. Somebody who published a paper with Erdish, you have Erdish number two, and so on and so on. So we have the same thing. I, I don't know that there's a website though that calculates your earnest number. But a nice nice parallel to be made here between Kevin Bacon and Paul Erdish. Well, I mean, of course, I'm not going to ask you anything about Bacon number or Ernish number. What is very interesting, though, is the Ernish Bacon number.
which is the sum of the two. And then it got me Keller. Who played uh, Winnie Cooper on the Wonder Years. Has a uh, Ernest Bacon number of six. So an Erdish number of four and a Bacon number of two. Natalie Portman. As a British bacon number of seven. An Irish number of five and a bacon number of two. Colin for. Also has a Erdish bacon number of seven. In his case, six plus one. How are we doing here? Now I know what you're thinking. What about what about an Ernest Bacon Sabbath number? If you're a member of Black Sabbath, then you have a Sabbath number of zero. If you're not a member of Black Sabbath, but played a concert, with black Sabbath, then you have a Sabbath number of one. And so on and so on. You can have fun with this by looking at birdishbeaconsabbath.com where you'll find that uh, Stephen Hawking has an Erdish number of two, a Bacon number of two, and a Sabbath number of two. How are we doing here? Questions? Anybody? Maybe a good place to end then. This will have been our last class. So no classes next week. Take it easy, concentrate on your other courses. I do not, well, I mean, no. Needless to say, I've not appeared in anything. Certainly, I'm a terrible musician and I've never published anything, so. I don't even have a nerdish number. But it's all good. So, yeah, so, so no class next week. Concentrate on your other courses. And if you have any questions, email me. Like I said, uh, we'll have a shortish 
final, somewhere between six and eight questions. I haven't written it yet. If uh, there's any material that I haven't mentioned earlier today, I will post an, an announcement on my courses. It's all good. It's the end of the semester. You guys enjoy. Uh, well, I mean, listen, if you, if you need to discuss anything, email me. We'll, uh, we'll set something up. Thank you all for coming. And you guys have a good one. Like I said, email me if there's anything. Otherwise, good luck on your final exams. You guys, uh, you guys take it easy.